we thank you so much for joining. I know you're really busy, and I we appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to join us. Uh, we're recording this uh, also for our friends at Roger Scott at Ridge on High School and Germantown High School and for our YouTube channel. Uh, and we're joined by Jennifer Riley Collins, a, a Mississippi history maker in several in several aspects. Uh, had amazing uh, jobs in the government pretty much her entire career, uh, including 22 years in the U.S. Army, which I'll let you uh, I'll let you tell us about. But uh, I've got a room full here at Velma Jackson High School, and we'll have some uh, some questions for you that they've come up with. But I'll let you tell your story because it's got to be heard to be believed. Oh, that's funny. Thank you so very much. Uh, uh, I will tell you, uh, Mr. Pygott, it has it is an honor always to uh, sit in this room uh, with your students. I am glad that we're coming to a, a closing point of this pandemic season. I hope to join you all in person at some point. Oh, next uh, we're going to make it happen. Yes, yes, most definitely. Um, just for the students, thank you for giving me your listening ear this morning. Um, I'm here, I hope, to inspire you to be whatever it is you want to be. Um, I am uh, honored to be here. Uh, as Mr. Pagas said, I am a 32-year uh, military veteran. Oh, uh, I served 10 years. Yes, sir. I uh, served uh, as an intelligence officer in the United States Army, uh, rising to the rank of Fulbert Colonel. Uh, I'm honored to do that. And, and, and so let me tell you a little bit about that piece of my life. OK, I uh, joined the military, uh, honestly, with the intent just on buying a car. <laughs> Crazy reason to join the military. But I found the military to be an absolute wonderful family, uh, a network that is supportive even in this uh, era of my life, uh, having now been retired. Uh, why do I point out that I rose to the rank of Fulbright Colonel? Well, let me just be real honest with you. And I know that I am speaking to a diverse group of students in the Mississippi Delta. Uh, let me let you all know, even though I didn't grow up in the Delta, I grew up next to the railroad track. Um, I am the baby girl of seven children of a man that was a truck driver, pupwood hauler and hogwood farmer. And my mother was a maid. Um, right next to the railroad track, baby girl. And to grow up and attain the rank of Fulberg Colonel is uh, no small feat. Uh, and let me tell you why. Only 2% of any officer that enters the military, regardless of whether you enter um, as a, um, through ROTC, through what's called Officer um, OCS, Officer Candidate School, um, or even through one of the military academies, including West Point, only 2% of any officer ever rises to the rank of Fulbright Colonel. Now add unto that, the fact that I'm an African-American woman, the fact that I was selected for the intelligence corps, and I, will be tell, and I will tell you without any shame, that is the cream of the crop of the United States military. Absolutely. Um, and to uh, be part of that 2% and then a fraction of that 2%, I give God all the glory for that. Okay. Um, and so, uh, you know, during my time in the military, I was honored to lift my hand to swear to defend this constitution, United States, foreign and domestic, right? Um, I also took a similar oath as an attorney. Uh, so not an attorney in the military, intelligence officer in the military. Along the way, I went to law school and uh, have been honored to uh, serve the citizens in, uh, of this state and am now, to be very honest with you, Mr. Pygott, in a position to uh, serve uh, the Delta region. Uh, I am doing some work with uh, Chairman Corey, Dr. Corey Wiggins, who has been named the Delta Regional Authority um, Federal Co-Chair for eight states along the Mississippi region. And so I am uh, in this capacity supporting him currently um, and as in during his transition and excited to do that. But all of that, I think being able to be in this position today is because of my military service, uh, is because you know I kept my hands to the plow and my eyes to my books and um, studied the studied law have served uh, in various capacities supporting government agencies, nonprofit agencies, for-profit agencies. And so uh, last year, students, I launched my own business, J. Riley Collins Consulting. And that is why I'm sitting this in this capacity right now, 
um, because I was contracted to help uh, the federal chairman with his transition. Yeah, and 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 that's a, a and that's a, a you're super humble. That's a very condensed story, but um, I know you started out in the army as enlisted, and then you became an officer later. Um, now, for some of our young people that may be, uh, you know, even if they kind of considering the military, it's not just kick doors down and blow stuff up. I mean, obviously, oh, no. if you want to do something <laughs> like that, they can find a spot for you. But there's a, a, any job in the civilian world would be available in, you know, in the in the armed forces. And that could train you to move into the workforce. And it could also if you wanted to go to college, that could also pay for your college as well. So. Um, yeah, so let me let me let me touch on that. And so the military is a microcosm of the world. Okay, um, it like he just said, any job that you want to do, if you want to uh, be a pilot, you can learn to fly in the military. If you want to be a cook, a, a chef, you can get cul culinary skills in the military. Um, if you want to be a a plumber or HVAC person, those skills are embedded in the military. If you want to be a truck driver, there's logistical support in the military. Everything, every walk of life, you know, from, from a lawyer to a doctor um, to an executive, you can learn those skills in the military and those skills actually transition. So like he said, it's not all about toting guns and, and uh, kicking in doors. Now there is that aspect for some <laughs> folk, if that's what you wanna do. Uh, you know, If you wanna go hard, there is space for you to do that as well. If you wanna sit outside uh, uh, and, and be of, of, of assistance to somebody, you can do that. Nurse Corps, all of that is embedded in the United States military. And yes, I did start out actually as Private Riley. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and it goes back to, you know, I decided I hadn't gone home um, during the spring break uh, to, which is normally when you go home and try to, you know, start securing a job for the summer. And, um, and I had to work, my family was not wealthy, right? And so, um, I said, oh, I didn't get a summer job. So, you know what? I think I'm going to join the military because I want a car. I'm out here at Alcorn State University. Uh, you need one and, up. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's kind of, and I want to be able to get to where I'm going. Um, and so I think I can buy a car, you know, with what I earned this summer going through basic training. And then because of drill pay, I'll have money to put gas in the car and pay a little car note if I, you know, um, and I discovered very quickly, I did not like being private Riley. It wasn't for me. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so when I went back to college in the fall, I immediately went to the ROTC building and, um, joined ROTC. So <laughs> that's, that's that story. Now, and, and I know you, you know, you're, you're, I know you're from Meridian, um, and then you went mm -hmm. to Alcorn State, but then you went to law school at Mississippi College. That's correct. So. Um, you know, as somebody that has the HBCU undergrad and then the PWI advanced degree, I always like hearing perspectives on the pros and cons of both because they both offer great things that maybe the other one can't. So uh, if, you know, we have if we have young people that may be considering the HBCU route, the PWI route, or a, a combination of both, what do those offer when they're coming out of uh, out of high school getting ready to prepare for the next step? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to circle back to what I just said a, a few minutes ago, uh, because I didn't uh, touch on the point that he made earlier about going to college. Between undergrad and uh, getting my law degree, I also have a master's degree. And guess who paid for that master's degree? The United mm -hmm. States Army. Uh, they paid 75% of my master's degree and I paid the 25% out of my pocket. Um, and because I went to I went to school during during the time that I was on on active duty. And I will tell you that um, I was supported in doing that um, by the people that I worked with and uh, was, even though I was sitting in a, in a critical uh, staff position, uh, but because of the military benefits of tuition assistance, 75% of a master's degree, you know, that's money in the bank. Yeah, uh, now. I mean, it's, it's gone up even more since we've gone through school. Yes. And so let me let me circle back to the to the next question. So what does an HBCU offer you? It offers you family. It offers you support. I can tell you I had a sister in school right ahead of me and her and she was at Uni University of Southern Mississippi. 
her experience and my experience are night and day. Yeah. Uh, I had uh, Dr. Cotton, um, who was the department chair, yell at me across campus one day. I heard, Miss Riley, Miss Riley. And so in that age, you know, you were very respectful of your elders. And I heard my department chair calling my name. And um, he said, so as I approached him, you know, I ran to see what, yes, sir, Dr. Cotton, what, what can I do for you? And he was like, uh, you do realize you cannot get out of Alcorn State University without coming through me. And, you know, he said, you need to take my classes. I feel like you're avoiding my classes. And the fact that he knew my name, even though I had not taken a class from him and he knew who was in, that's what you get at an HBCU. My sister was just a number at USM. Her words, not mine. I am repeating what I've heard several times. I'll say the same thing. And I was at USM. And so um, she will tell you that she almost failed out of USM because nobody cared to make sure that she was hitting the right marks. Um, um, and so that 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 difference does exist. I'm not saying that anything is wrong with you, the University of Southern Mississippi is not, but what you get at an HBCU is also what I will be just be, speak very frankly. Uh, a lot of people are trying to avoid you getting. Um, so you've heard probably if you're listening to the news or heard your parents have discussion about this thing called critical race theory, right? So let me just speak frankly. That's some stuff, okay? Uh, it is a way for history not to be told. It's nothing new in Mississippi though, y'all. Our history has never been told, okay? And when I say our, I mean African-American history has never been told in Mississippi. Even though there are schools that were set up that when there was the white flight out of public schools, um, you know, and segregation academies were set up because parents didn't, white parents didn't want their kids going to school with black, with black kids, you know, the, the, the people who were in power were still controlling what was put in textbooks. And so the history has always been erased. But guess what I learned at Alcorn State University? I learned my history. I learned things that were never taught to me. Um, my family, just to be very honest with you, didn't share a lot of African-American history. I've not done the same with, with my kids, but, but my parents grew up in an era, and I grew up in an era where my family felt like they had to hide certain things to protect us. So it wasn't that they were trying to deny. When I say they, my parents were not trying to deny our history, but I got that all at Alcorn State University. I got the foundation for knowing, for learning how to study. How do I actually study so that I retain this information that then becomes the, the, the foundation for what later became success? It is, how do I learn to think critically? Those are things that I learned at HBCU besides that, that familial support, um, the, um, how, how I established friendships that and networks that will I relied upon. I'm 56 years old and I still rely upon relationships that I established at Alcorn State University. Um, my PWI experience um, at a um, uh, at Mississippi College. It was a different experience. I'll be very honest with you. I actually came back to Mississippi in 1997 and to attend law school and in 1997 was the first time I have I had heard because I had been gone in the military and lived a different life uh been in more of a diverse community um I heard a white man tell me you need to realize you're a black woman back in Mississippi that's still traumatizing to me today yeah um, now I will tell you I'm the type of person who says Oh, now you just presented yourself a challenge because I was, it made me more determined to do well in law school and to control my own outcomes. Um, my name is Jennifer Riley Collins. I've always kept my father's name. My father had two girls, okay, biological children. Now he raised all of my, all of my siblings, but he had two biological children and it, he had no biological sons. And so I've always kept his last name because I, I am intent on carrying his legacy forward. That's awesome. And my, that PWI said, oh no, you're gonna graduate with the name Collins. And 
my, my auntie reminded me of this just the other day. She said, I was so proud of you when you said, then just give me my document because I'm not going to walk across your stage if you're not going to call my daddy's name. Yeah. Um, and so those experiences, while, while they informed how I move, how I live now, they are very different. Um, and so I'm not saying don't go to a PWI. Go where you need to go to get what you need to get for where God is sending you for that, so, so that you'll be equipped. But if you know you need that little extra support, I'm encouraging you to go to an HBCU um, so that you'll have what you need to have that foundation for your success. Yeah, and, and, and I always love hearing, the, hearing the, uh, the, uh, the people that have done both, hearing their perspective on that. Um, and also in, in the government, you, you know, you've been a part of Mississippi ACLU. You were, uh, for a short time, the uh, county administrator for Hines County. So, um, and obviously that's local government stuff. And yesterday I had, and on a different class, I had Kimberly Campbell talk about the importance of, you know, we have a state election coming up next year and I, not, nobody that's with me now is going to be old enough to vote. But as they get older, how important is that they realize, you know, the, the role they play in the local and state governments? Because, um, you know, Justice Jim Kitchens for the Supreme Court told our kids one time that when he was growing up in Kapai County, that uh, the people his age that were black weren't able to vote because they were intimidated away from the polling place. Yes. Um, and then Kimberly Campbell was talking about her great aunt was having to pass these crazy tests just to be able to cast a vote. So, you know, and, and you know, we all know the presidential election coming up in 2024, but how much more important are these local and state elections that really affect our lives every day? I was going to say, let's talk about this, the state elections that are going to happen this year, right? So this year you will have judicial races and you'll have congressional races. Um, they're, they're already underway. Um, people have already had to qualify. So Yazoo is in second congressional district. And so you will be voting for- um, You're in Madison County. You're in Madison County. So we, okay. are, so we are in the second congressional district though in this okay. area. Okay. So even if, you, if, even if you live in Michael Guest district, you know, or Congressman Thompson's district, or if you're supporting the one of the opponents for one of those offices, please know that your vote matters. Why should you can be concerned about what happens in Congress? Because Congress controls appropriations that come. So I know you guys have all probably heard about, you know, the infrastructure bill, the bipartisan infrastructure bill. That's about roads and bridges that your school buses drive on. That is about whether or not you get broadband access. What is broadband access? That's the internet. Okay. Especially in a rural um, community like ours, that's so important. Yes, it's about water and sewage, you know. So, you know, you may take it for granted that you can go in the bathroom and turn on water and flush the toilet. Well, guess what? There are still parts of, of, of the Delta region where that's that's not an automatic thing. I know y'all think that's crazy, ladies. 2022. No, it's real. Um, so you know, that's why those appropriations of, of that who that people in Congress make. And so and one that's close and, and near and dear to your heart, I'm sure, is um, when you talk about um, the COVID-19 response. And so some families got some stimulus checks, some students got those little cards, they help buy groceries in the house, you know, all of that's controlled by Congress. And so that money that came as a result of even your school district, Got some ARP funds, right? American Rescue Plan funds. All of that is controlled by Congress. So it matters who your congressperson is. Number two, local elections this year are judicial. So now you talking about who's going to be the judge. Very often in, in African-American communities, impoverished communities, our only touch point with the justice system is sometimes the courts. Okay, so who's sitting on a bench and whether or not that person has a perspective that or, or considers a, a perspective of life circumstances matters. So, uh, you know, pay attention and be a part of those conversations. And just because you can't vote yet, if you're 17 and you're going to be 18 before November, remember, you can go ahead and register to vote because you can cast your vote yep. in, in November. Okay. Um, the but if you're not old enough yet to register and cast your vote, please know 
that you can still participate. You can be civically engaged. You can ask questions. You can attend town halls. You can help canvas. That means the door knocking that um, candidates need to help get out their message to say, hey, you can um, go to polls. You can help do rise to the polls because you might not be able to vote yet, but you can drive. You got a driver's license at the age of 16. And so you can say, hey, I want to volunteer on your campaign to be a, a driver to help people get out to the polls. You're about to have in a couple of months, a whole summer where you can put your hand to the plow and be civically engaged. That's and a, I great encourage you resume to do that. a great resume builder. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, no matter no matter who you vote for or who you're helping, to be involved in your government like that is a great resume builder for any, anybody looking to work in any area. Oh yeah, to say you worked on somebody's campaign, trust okay. me, trust me, it, it 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 and it matters and it matters to that candidate. Um, you guys are young people. Y'all y'all do everything on one of these devices, right? So even if you are phone banking and texting and saying, "Hey, I can you know I can participate in text banking," um, that means texting folk and saying you know whatever candidate you're, you're you're working on, but definitely being able to put that on your resume, as Mr. Pike has said, uh, to say, "Hey, I worked on Jennifer Riley Collins' campaign for State Attorney General." Yeah. That's a historic campaign. <laughs> uh, I'm not running for anything right now. So let me just say that. But to, to say that you worked on, you know, whether it's Congressman Thompson or a judicial race, um, Michael Guest campaign, whichever your choice is, right? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, even if you have no desire to ever work in any type of government job, businesses want to see that, that you have the initiative to, uh, to be involved because these, uh, these policies affect businesses as well. Um, yes. especially, you know, now we have the, you know, with the, uh, the, the income tax, that's going to affect people being able to bring employees to our state. So all that is extremely important to, you know, to be knowledgeable in and, uh, and again, you know, I've never told a person who to vote for, but, you know, young black kids in the state don't understand that that opportunity was not always there and they really no. make the most of it. It wasn't. And, and, and let me just say, if you're not civically engaged and if you're not aware um, you know, some people have co-opted a phrase that is come that has colloquially appropriated by us, right? But now they've appropriated it about being woke. Okay, be aware. Okay, um, be aware that your vote, your right to have your voice heard, is very much under attack. Um, and if you're not participating in the process, then I'm unfortunately you'll just be a victim of the procedure. Absolutely. I mean, and again, the, you know, the old saying is, you know, if you don't vote, you don't have a right to complain. Uh, if you didn't take the time to exercise your constitutional right, it's a, it's a, it's a moot point. Uh, but I do have some questions from the students I want to get to because uh, I know we're, um, we're short on time, but I do want to, uh, all these are, all these are ninth graders and, and these are great. So this person is Leonard Garrett and he said, obviously you've had many different types of careers. What kept you going through all the hard times? My love for my sons. Uh, to be very honest with you, that's an easy answer, Mr. Garrett. Uh, I have three amazing sons. Um, my oldest son, Joseph, is a principal at a Boyd Elementary in Jackson Public Schools. My middle son, Jonathan, is an amazing insurance salesperson. He uses that work as a ministry because the reality is, you know, we will all come to a point where our family needs to lay us to rest. And so he does that to make sure that families are taken care of. My youngest son, uh, Joshua, is a fashion designer and he lives in Atlanta. He's a student at Savannah College of Art and Design. That is um, a great school. That's a, yeah. that's a great school. And so we are, uh, so just making the world a better place for them uh, was a driver for many years. I now am the proud grandmother of, th of two grandchildren, uh, Travis Michael and Drew Riley. And, um, you know, and so now I focus my effort on helping people do good work because I know I'm not going to be here forever. But if I, if I leave good work behind Absolutely. and help people do good work, it'll be a legacy for Travis and Drew. Absolutely. And any other grandchild that comes along. <laughs> now, this is America Jones. And she asked, what, what encouraged you to go from being in the Army to being an attorney? So I've always wanted to be an attorney. I can tell you that I was wearing, um, back in the day, they called them hush puppy, uh, shoes and a khaki outfit in the sixth grade at Carver, L Carver Middle School in Meridian, Mississippi, when I knew that that is what I wanted to do. It, I Honestly, I felt like it was a calling. Um, 
And uh, even this morning, as I'm, I'm in the Mississippi Delta today, um, as I was driving across the Delta, you know, I was reflecting back on that. Um, and so uh, being an attorney uh, is about understanding the law and applying the law to situations. It's not much different than, um, you know, it, it, it requires critical thinking. Being an intelligence officer required me to think critically and, and strategically. And so that is how actually I practice law. You know, I look to see what my opponent might do, uh, what the obstacles are, and that's how I approach the law. And so the, the, the two, it's not a jump from one, it, it's, it's really a blending. Yeah. Uh, Thank this, you, America. Yeah, this is Tatiana Jackson, and she asked, what advice would you give someone that was considering going to the Army? Do it. Uh, you know, uh, it, 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 it's, it's a great career. Um, you get to see the world. I can tell you, I, I've been to some places that are hot. I've been to some places that are cold. Uh, I've been to some places that are beautiful and I've been to some desolate places, but I got to see those and experience those things. Uh, I got to meet great people that I call friend forever, uh, that I call family forever. Um, it exposes you to, um, things that you just may not ever experience. And so I encourage you to do that. And, you know, one thing I jokingly say about the military, uh, it gives you everything you need. It gives you clothes because you'll have a uniform, you know, shoes, you have some boots and um, gives you a place to, to live. You'll have a barrack so you won't be homeless. It even gives you, gives you food to eat because you'll have a dining facility and it even gives you a little jewelry. It's yeah. called your dog tag. So... <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and I think it's also important, you know, everybody doesn't have to do 32 years like you did. It can be a, a temporary thing to gain some skills. It can be a, a temporary way, you know, to, uh, to, to get it like you, you know, if you want to get on your feet financially, they'll pay you to, to learn a skill. And when you get out, you can work in the civilian world. So, it's yeah. not, you know, it's not a, a, a lifelong commitment. It can be whatever whatever you're willing to give based on the um, on the contract you sign. But it, it, I think a lot of people think, well, I don't want to join the Army. I'll be doing it forever. No, you're not. You know, you, you know. They're there to train you and make sure you get the best out of it. And that would be with any branch, with the, yes. uh, the, the Navy, the Air Force, Marines as well, or the Coast Guard. So um, it, it's not a it's not a, a lifelong commitment like some of them may think. Um, no, not at all. Not at all. Um, you know, like you said, it, it, it could be temporary. It could be reserved. It doesn't even have to be active duty. Um, you may start out and say, you know, I'm not sure about it. So I'm just going to do the reserves and then get in and then realize, oh, I actually like this. And you can transition between the two. You may start out on active duty and say, man, when this tour is over, I'm just going to go to the reserves. I still want to be a part, but I don't want to do this every day. Um, so it's, it's a good way of life. Yeah. And, and we had a, uh, we had a kid who graduated a few years ago from here, 11 days after he graduated from high school, he shipped out with the air force. And he's been to the Philippines and Japan and Hawaii and Guam and just places I would never dream of. And just, exactly. you know, you know, for a kid from rural Mississippi, he's living the life and he's loving it. And he, and he does intelligence as well with the air force. He does a lot of, uh, a lot of computer intelligence. Um, and he, and he, he's, in, he's a tinker in Oklahoma city now, but he is absolutely loving it. Um, and he's getting some great, uh, some great skills. He'd be able to transfer into, into, into the civilian world while giving. Right. While giving government I was, so, let me, let me say this. I was, I know, cause I know our time is ticking. Um, I was watching this morning uh, as I was getting dressed uh, The on, on CBS, they were talking about um, being actually, you know, how you wear the Oculus devices and, you know, virtually and like you can virtually be in these sets and that type of thing. That's those are skills that you can learn in the United States Army, to be very honest with you. You have if you want if you're interested in cybersecurity, oh, yes. um, you know, they, they have a whole new cybersecurity um, force inside of, you know, branch in the military. And so that's, that's cool, you know, and those are jobs that honestly, you go get those military skills, get those training in the military, come out. And I'm telling you, there are companies that will eat you up to be very honest, to, to get you on their team. I just got, and I just got one more from the students. Uh, and this is Kawhi Cooper. And you were on the news about this. And she said, how serious did you take your role as being the first black woman to run for the uh, run for state attorney general? Very seriously, very seriously. Um, you know, uh, I, I didn't do it thinking I wasn't gonna win. I did it with a determination that honestly drove me from the day I made that decision um, and still drives me today, to be very honest with you. Uh, I didn't do it to make history. I just happened to make history along the way. I did it because I care about the state of Mississippi. I know that the laws that are in be being impacted 
are laws that will impact generations for a lifetime. And so uh, I get to still, you know, support organizations that work on policies, but I will tell you, I was very serious in my determination. And I hope that I inspired one of you, two of you, five of you to also understand that you can take seats at tables because those tables need your voices. And so do what you need to do to credential yourself so that you can run for public office and impact your community. Absolutely. Um, now we're almost out of time. And we thank you so much for joining us. I know you have a crazy schedule and you do so much in the community and with your own business, but you know, you, you know, you talked about, you grew up in rural Mississippi, you know, uh, in, in Lauderdale County. And uh, you, you even said you grew up with parents that didn't have, didn't have a whole lot, but yet you've become one of the, you know, one of the, the, the most influential females in the state of Mississippi. And you've done some um, amazing work and you've served our country for so long, which is, you know, we're all, we all should be indebted to you for that. But, you know, these kids too are in rural Mississippi and they're young black kids, just like you were uh, however many years ago, but yet you overcome all those obstacles. And I've, and I've said from the beginning, you know, no, nobody's owed anything, including me but it's even tougher to be black in this country. And you're gonna have obstacles no matter what your circumstances are, but you've overcome all those and just absolutely crushed it. So what can these kids do now, even if they never wanna be an attorney, they never wanna to go to the military, to overcome these obstacles they are going to face at some point? Believe in yourself, believe that you can. And um, when the obstacles get tough, know that it's time to just dig in a little bit deeper. Um, believe in the support of your family. Um, build bridges, not just for yourself, but for those coming behind you and coming alongside of you. Um, build networks um, that you can rely upon. Uh, but number one, believe in yourself. And I'm a, I'm a person of faith, so I have to tell you, believe in God. Um, believe in how, how you, ever you want to believe, but that's what made, that's what made a difference in my life, my belief system. And so, um, but because I knew that I had, that he had me, I could have myself too. Well, and again, that's, that's great advice. And, uh, and, and you're just so humble in, in the way that, uh, you know, there's no way you should ever downplay your accomplishments that you've done. And it's, it's inspiring to me. Um, so, and again, and we thank you for all you do. And we all obviously thank you for what you've done for our country and for our state and continue to do. So uh, again, you, and, you know, and I, I hope that uh, people watching now, people watching later, follow what you're doing because it's, uh, it's really getting the word out about a lot of important stuff. So Jennifer Riley Collins, we thank you so much for joining us. And I hopefully we'll have you on campus here soon so you can talk about all, uh, face to face some of the things that you've done. Always willing to come and support your students. Thank you so very much for always inviting me. Oh, uh, you're a great guest. Thank you so much, my friend. We'll talk to you soon. All righty. Bye bye. Okay.